Good morning. So far uh, in our sermon series on the seven deadly sins, we've talked about envy and we've talked about pride. Uh, specifically, we've talked about a certain kind of pride. We called it vain glory. And I want to remind you again, the purpose of this sermon series is not to cover every sin imaginable. Uh, it's also not to cover what we might consider the worst of sins. Okay, we're not going to talk about rape or murder or child abuse. Uh, what we're trying to do with this series is we're looking at some of the heart problems that lie behind our specific sins. So for instance, if I can work on my envy, uh, that'll help with some other sins, things like gossip or trying to tear other people down. Uh, if I can clean up my vainglory, it'll help me be a better servant to others and seek ways to lift other people up. Um, there's a lot of other sins that go with each of these heart vices. And so the idea with this sermon series is that rather than try to treat specific symptoms, okay, like say I've got this one particular sin, so I need to work on that one thing in my life. The idea is to really get at the heart of the issue, the root of the issue, uh, which are these various vices. Um, traditionally, these have been called the seven deadly sins or the seven deadly vices. And so this morning we get to a vice that surprises a lot of people that it even makes the list. Uh, this is also the only vice with its own spirit animal. And I found a good picture of this I thought was just perfect. You know, honestly, after a week of doing my job and schoolwork and working on interviewing various youth minister candidates and then chasing my kids around all night, especially on the morning an hour of sleep, I look at this picture and think, maybe that guy has the right idea. Okay, anyone else think their lives might be better if you had a little bit more sloth and rather than a little bit less? Okay, a few of you will admit to it. Uh, in 1987, the magazine Harper had an article that was covering the seven deadly sins. And when they got to sloth, this was the tagline. I thought this was great. It said, if sloth had been the original sin, we'd all still be in paradise. Okay, and when I initially think about the idea of sloth as a modern vice, the picture that comes to mind is a 20-something pothead living in his parents' basement who doesn't want to go get a job, doesn't want to go to college. What he wants to do is eat Doritos and play GTA on his PlayStation. Okay, and there's time later in life to actually work. Okay, I saw a good cartoon this week that I think sums up this problem pretty well. I thought this was good. It says, I plan on living with my parents until I'm so old that people think I'm a good son who moved back in to help them out. Okay. I thought that was good. All right, now, don't hear me wrong this morning. Sometimes for a variety of reasons, adult kids will live with their parents, and there's good reasons for that. I'm not judging that. Okay, but if the reason that an adult child is living at home with mom and dad is just because he doesn't want to work, that's a problem. <laughs> Someone knows what I'm talking about. Okay, when I think of sloth, I think of laziness. I think of someone who just can't get motivated to work. Someone who just wants to take it easy, relax. Someone who's lazy. Uh, whenever Rachel and I were living in Texas, our next door neighbor lost his job. Uh, and I remember hearing about that. I talked to him about that one day. He was out in his front yard and I went and I said, man, I'm really sorry you lost your job. How's the job search going for you? And he said, well, the government's extended unemployment. So I'm going to wait till that gets closer to running out. Then I'll start looking for a job. At that point, I got to practice the virtue of keeping my mouth shut. Okay. Not always my strong suit. All right, and if sloth were simply laziness, then the solution would be a kick in the pants. Can I say that in church? I can say that in church. Okay. All right, what my neighbor needed, what the grown children who just want to mooch off their parents need, is a good work ethic. Don't you know that it was the Protestant work ethic that made this country great? You know, if my Depression-era grandparents were still alive and heard me say, I don't want to work, I'm just going to coast on the government for a while, uh, they might literally beat me. You know, my meemaw was sweet, but she didn't put up with foolishness. Okay? You can't grow up on a farm or remember really hard times and have laziness be one of your vices. 
Okay, and there's numerous scriptures that address the problem of laziness. For instance, Proverbs 6, 9. It says, how long will you lie there, you sluggard? Sluggard's a great word. We should bring that one back. It says, when will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. 2 Thessalonians 3.10, Paul said this. He said, For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. I think if my neighbor had been hungry, he would have been a whole lot more motivated to get a job a little bit faster. Right? This seems pretty obvious. If you want to be godly, you need to work. It's not good to be lazy. Okay? And if you can't work, if there's something that's physically Preventing you from work, that's one thing. And I'm happy to help you out and do whatever I can for you. But if you're not working just because you don't want to, just because you're lazy, then you should starve. I have no sympathy for that. All of us need to work as we are able. Okay, and so I imagine that many of you this morning at this point feel better about this vice than you might have the last two. Okay, we all have a little bit of pride, and we hear a sermon on pride, and you think, yeah, there's ways that I should be more serving towards others. We hear a sermon on envy, and we think, well, there is some places in my life I'm a little bit envious. Okay, but finally, preacher, you got to a vice that's not a problem for me. I work hard. I work long hours. I'm busy. In fact, I'm too busy. If anything, preacher, I don't need a sermon on sloth. I need a sermon about how to carve out some Sabbath time. Hey, I don't need a kick in the pants. I need a vacation. Any of you feel like you're too busy? Amen. Okay, if you are too busy, then honestly, you need to pay special attention to the sermon this morning uh, because this is a vice that might hit closer to home than you think. Okay, because something that I learned this week as I was studying this vice is you can, in fact, be an extremely busy person and still be very guilty of the vice of sloth. In fact, often we use our busyness as a way to be slothful. Okay, I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, one of the odder stories in Scripture happens in Genesis chapter 19, okay, which is the story of God destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. Right, and if you remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, you remember it begins a chapter earlier in chapter 18 where God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I'm getting ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Their wickedness is just too great. I can't put up with it any longer. It's too unrighteous. I'm going to wipe the whole thing off. And Abraham goes, okay, but I got family down there. I got my nephew Lot and his family. They're all living right next to Sodom. And I would really prefer if you didn't destroy it. And so he gets back and forth with God. And he says, God, if you find X number of righteous people, don't destroy it. God says, okay. They go back and forth. Finally, it comes down to God says, if there's just a handful of righteous people, I'll spare it. But there's not. But God says, Lot, because he's your nephew, Abram, I will spare his life. Okay. And here's what happens next. Uh, chapter 19, verse 15. It says, with the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot saying, hurry, take your and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and of his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, Flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. Okay, skip down to verse 23. It says, by the time Lot reached Zor, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, this is the original hellfire and brimstone, by the way. From the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. Okay, so God wipes out the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then you have a really odd verse in verse 26. It says, but Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Okay, and that last line seems really strange to me. What was her sin? Why was it such a big deal that after she's fled, she did what the angel commanded, she left the city, she gets out because she's following her husband Lot, and yet she turns and looks back. She's punished so much for that that it cost her her life. 
Okay, I know that the angel had said, don't look back, and that that was a, a guilty thing that she did, but what was really her sin? Okay, interestingly enough, in classic interpretation of this text, the theologians say that her sin was the sin of sloth. And that sounds weird to me. Why sloth? She wasn't lazy. Okay, her sin had nothing to do with an unwillingness to go to work every day. So how can Lot's wife be guilty of sloth? Okay, and the answer is that Lot's wife wasn't ready to let go of her former life in Sodom and Gomorrah. She wasn't ready to let go of what was behind her. Her looking back wasn't just, oh, I want to see what's going on. Her looking back is a way of saying, man, I really miss what it was right there. She's still looking backwards. She didn't want to work for the narrow road of doing things God's way. Instead, she wanted to hold on to the familiar, to the life she would leave behind in Sodom. So here's what I mean. Okay, sloth isn't really how hard you work a nine-to-five job. Sloth is when we hold back from God. Okay, here's my definition. If you're taking notes, write this down. Okay, sloth is the unwillingness to make every effort to attain holiness. Sloth is the unwillingness to make every effort to attain holiness. Okay, true sloth in the classic sense is not laziness in physical work. Sloth is spiritual laziness. Sloth is when we choose the easy road over the narrow way. Sloth is when I know that I have things that I need to get right in my life, and I either avoid them entirely or think, you know, I just got a lot going on right now, and I will work on that, but I'll work on it later. That's sloth. Earlier in our service, we read the story of the rich young ruler. Uh, he comes before Jesus. He says, Lord, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Which sounds like a great question. I want to know how to inherit eternal life. Jesus says, follow the commandments. The man says, I've done that. Jesus says, okay, sell your stuff. Give the money away to the poor. And the man leaves sad. Why? Because he had great wealth. Okay, we'll talk about greed for the next vice. That's next on our list. Okay, and to a certain extent, that's part of the man's problem. But another part of the rich young ruler's problem is that he knew exactly what he needed to do to really be holy. He just couldn't get motivated enough to do it. Sloth is when we are spiritually lazy. All right, here is where we kind of get messed up in this. Here's why kind of in our spiritual DNA, we have a problem thinking about spiritual work as being a good thing. Okay, we tend to think about making efforts as a problem. Okay, a long time ago, way back in the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church taught that there were certain things you did, certain acts of penance that you performed to earn grace. So if you wanted grace, there was a list of things you needed to do. You needed to go to confession, you needed to take communion, you needed to get baptized, all these different things that you did as acts of penance to earn grace. These were called the sacraments of the church. Okay, of course, the problem with that, and really the reason that the entire Protestant Reformation happened, is because a lot of Christians came together and said, look, you don't do anything to earn grace. Grace is given to you by the grace of God Almighty, by the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't earn your salvation. Salvation is a gift. Okay, and so what we believe... <clears throat> What Scripture teaches is that the gospel is the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Okay? The gospel, the good news, is the Jesus story. Okay? And we also believe you cannot earn your salvation. Right? Jesus did the work for you. What we do is we accept the grace that God offers us. Okay? Scripture teaches you want to accept the grace of Jesus. The way you do that is repent and be baptized. Right? I'm not saved by any work that I have done. I am saved by accepting the work that Jesus did for me. Right? That's Christianity 101. We're all there? Okay. But this is where being a disciple or a follower of Jesus starts. Okay. The majority of the New Testament is not about getting you into the waters of baptism. The majority of the New Testament is about the spiritual growth that should take place as you grow in your relationship with God after baptism. 
And that, the process of spiritual growth, takes work. Okay, you don't do work to earn your salvation, but you work on your relationship with God. Okay, just like in a marriage, it doesn't take any work to get married. It doesn't even take work to be married. People all the time have marriages they don't work at at all. And any two people can go down to a courthouse and get married. That doesn't take any work. Getting married doesn't require work. Having a good marriage, though, well, that takes some work, right? Sometimes your wife messes with the Netflix queue, right? I mean, there's... Okay, having a good marriage takes work. That's not something that just happens. You have to work at your marriage. Okay, likewise, it doesn't really take any work to start a relationship with God. Okay, God did all the work for you. Jesus did the work. Entering a relationship with God is easy. But do you want to have a good relationship with God? That takes work. Sloth isn't general laziness. Sloth is when you are lazy at working on your relationship with God. All right, here's some scriptures that, that teach this exact thing. Okay, for instance, Romans 14, 19. Paul says, let us, therefore, make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. And Paul will talk about the work that we're supposed to do. How do we make every effort? Okay, Ephesians chapter 4, he makes the same argument. He says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And he'll talk in Ephesians about how we've been given this ministry of reconciliation. Here's the work that you're supposed to do to create reconciliation between you and God and you and each other. It's work. Hebrews 12, 14. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Well, okay, according to Hebrews, how do we become holy? We have to make an effort, right? 2 Peter chapter 1, start in verse 5. He said, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every what effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Over and over again, Scripture tells us that part of the process of being a disciple of Jesus Christ is we work. We give effort at becoming more like God. If you are a baptized believer, you have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling inside of you, giving you power. And the task before you is to use that Holy Spirit power and become holy. You literally should become more like God as you grow and mature. And over and over again in Scripture, this process of becoming holy requires effort. It requires work. You know, the old word that preachers used to use for this is the process of sanctification. Okay, some of you remember old preachers saying that word, right? Sanctification. Okay, what that means is it's the process of becoming holy. The name for the vice when we resist that, when we don't want to put forth that effort, is sloth. So do you see why I say you can be extremely busy and yet still be guilty of the vice of sloth? Okay, it's a whole lot easier to fill my life with work and family and extracurricular activities and be very busy. It's easier to do that than it is to be intentional about my spiritual development. You know, one of the easiest ways to not grow as a Christian is to be too busy. Sloth gets in the way of you becoming like Jesus. So if you're here this morning and if you feel like you've been a Christian for years, but you're still in the same place spiritually that you were years ago, okay, you might have a sloth problem. 
If you use your busyness as an excuse not to examine the deeper places of your soul, you might have a sloth problem. If you avoid having the meaningful conversations that you need to have with other people in order to form real relationships, you might have a sloth problem. Okay, we talked about this in Bible class this morning, but if you change churches regularly, that's a sign of sloth. If all being a Christian really means to you is you show up for service on Sunday morning, then you have a sloth problem. If you're not practicing the spiritual disciplines, okay, fasting, prayer, giving, hospitality, those things, you might have a sloth problem. Uh, currently, I'm reading a book. It's, it's The Imitation of Jesus by Thomas A. Kempis. Um, and there's this line in there that I just thought was perfect for this. He says, For a little reward, people make a long journey. For eternal life, many will scarcely lift a foot off the ground. That's sloth. We get into this mindset that says, well, Jesus did all the work, so I don't have to do anything anymore. And that's not the attitude that, that the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches us you want to become like Jesus. That requires work. Are we diligent in making every effort to attain holiness? Okay, so what's the solution to this problem of sloth? How do we root this vice out of our lives? Okay, honestly, I don't have an easy answer for you at this point. Okay, but I would go back to the marriage metaphor we had earlier. Because if you've been married for any length of time, you know that sometimes there are periods in your marriage where you don't necessarily feel like being married that day. Okay, and so what do you do? Do you leave your spouse? Or do you do the things of love anyways? Okay, are there times when you don't necessarily feel like being loving towards your spouse? Yeah, but what should you do in a healthy marriage? You act lovingly towards your spouse anyway. Okay, are there times in your relationship with God where you don't feel like growing? Yes. Okay, that's when you persist in prayer. That's when you persist in the ministry that you're involved with that doesn't necessarily excite you like it used to. That's where you persist in giving your money and your time and your energy at church. That's where we develop the virtue of persistence. Okay, because in marriage, you only achieve a truly great marriage when you learn to persist through the hard times. I think your relationship with God is the same way. I think we've got to learn how to persist in making every effort. I think the relationship we have with God is worth it. This time in our service, we're going to sing a few verses of an invitation song. Uh, during the singing of this song, I will be down front. One of our shepherds will be down front. We would love to talk with you or pray with you about anything that's going on in your lives. Um, if you're not a Christian, if you've never put on Jesus in baptism, the best time to start that walk is today, is right now. Uh, we would love to sit down and talk with you in Scripture about what that looks like. We would love to help you with that in any way we can. If there's anything this morning that we can do for you, please come talk to us now while we stand and while we sing.